We're going to have to share the microphone this morning. Good. Our three questions. Our three questions this morning, and we're not going to mention fruit today. Uh, yeah. Stu, would you mind sharing with us your most embarrassing moment, if if you can? This is getting close to it right here. I can tell you, yeah. Well, we don't have enough time, Matt. Uh, I, I could tell you something. I'll just tell you one that happened to me a month ago. We were we were having a, a memorial service where my wife's mother passed away earlier this year, and the family couldn't get all together until just about a month ago. And um, some of the granddaughters were supposed to do the scripture reading, and none of them were willing to do it. At the last minute, they just said, no, no, we don't want to do it. So someone asked my son's wife, my son and his wife have been married five years now, and they asked Jennifer if she would do it, and she, she agreed that she would, and then they asked me to introduce her. And I got up, and I was trying to explain to everybody who Jennifer was, and I said, well, she's kind of a member of the family, but not really a member of the family. You know, she's married into it, and then everybody started to go, Oh, she is a member of the family, and I felt so bad, and I've been introducing her ever since as a member of the family, and I'm, it was terrible. I felt, I love her so much, and I'm, what was your most embarrassing moment, Matthew? <laughs> That's easy, yesterday. <laughs> Pete, Pete Chereens, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'd have to say that that would have to be one of my most embarrassing moments. Um, but probably, boy, that's, that is a tough one, isn't it? I didn't know you were going to ask me these questions too. I'll have to think about that. I'll tell you tomorrow, okay? Stu, if you could change anything, anything about yourself, what would it be? Um... You know, what I would really like to change about myself is that I'm really a very shy person. I'm an uh, introvert. I, I don't meet people easily. Uh, and a lot of people seem to be surprised because I love to preach and I, I love to get up and, uh, and talk to people like this. But, but after the uh, security of standing between you and the pulpit, I mean the, the pulpit between us, then, uh, then when we have to meet new people, it's uh, it's a bit of a, a challenge for me. And I wish I was like, have you all heard Manuel Escorcio this week? Wouldn't I love to have his personality? You know, he was in the youth tent last night, and he was he was doing this thing about uh, deep sea diving, and he was going like just making a fool out of himself. I'd like to be able to do that a lot better. I think. <laughs> Talk about pizzerines, and it works too. Uh, <laughs> Stu, on a more serious note, before we have a word of prayer this morning, what does prayer mean to you as an individual? I wish we had time to talk about uh, my prayer journey. It's been an interesting one. I'm, many years ago, my mother passed away after her husband, who was um, uh, an Adventist pastor, retired. Uh, his wife had died of cancer and he married my mother, and then uh, he told me that uh, my mother was going to get better because he had been praying about it, claiming all the promises, and then she died, and uh, I began to really study what prayer was, and uh, it it's means so much to me because I've come to understand that prayer is our opportunity to open up our heart to God and tell him what's really on it. And I think the challenge that we have in prayer is not to tell God what we think he wants us to say. Not to tell him what we think he wants to hear, but to tell him what's really on our heart. In fact, I'm subscribed to a theory that I read in a book that says that opening your heart to God in prayer is the only real religious issue there is, being honest with God. And that's what I think prayer is, and we need to do a better job at it, I think. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us, um, Stu. We're really enjoying your studies that you're conducting with us in the mornings and, and also the ministry that you're providing in the youth tent. 
So we can be thankful that Stu is with us, can't we? Let's have a word of prayer together before we start our study. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for this new day. We thank you, Lord, that every new day reminds us of what a wonderful God you are, a creator, the sustainer of life, the redeemer of our lives, and the soon-to-come king. Lord, we thank you that you mean just so very much to us. We thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your justice. This morning, Lord, we also want to thank you for your word. And this morning, as Pastor Stuart Tyner opens your word to us, we ask that you will help us to learn lessons that will help us in our daily, daily walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're trusting that the airplanes are not going to circle. And I've been promised that the kindy tent will stay in the kindy tent this morning. That's good. Thank you for coming. Well, it seems darker in here today, but the sun is out and the rain stopped for a little bit. Felt a little bit warmer to me today. So thank you for being here in this uh, time of the day as we open God's Word and study some great episodes in the history of God's people from the Old Testament. I want to remind you again that the hero of the Bible stories is God, not all the other people that we study about. They were very human people, just like we are. And one of the inspiration, one of the, the proofs of inspiration of the Bible to me has always been how real and human the people are that are there. Uh, we looked yesterday at at Moses writing about his brother, the things that his brother said, I just threw that gold in the fire and out came the calf. That's an inspired evidence to me. God is the hero, not the humans. That the Bible is God's voice speaking to us today. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. We need to hear what God wants to speak to us today about. And finally, that every Bible story teaches us about salvation. So as we approach the Bible with those three presuppositions in mind, if you'd like to open your Bible to the first chapter of Joshua and the last chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to look today at the story of the children of Israel crossing into the promised land from the east of Jericho, coming into the promised land from the east crossing the river and uh, going to the land that God promised them. Before we get to the actual crossing of the river, though, let's look at the setting. You know, on a clear day, from the top of Mount Nebo to the east of Jericho, today you can see the promised land. Not quite like Moses saw it, just as he climbed that mountain for the last time. Look to the north and the south, all the way over to the sea, God opened up his vision so clearly that he could see not only the geography of the land, but the people inhabiting the land. Moses' people, his people that he had given up so much for in Egypt, the people that he had uh, led through all those years of the wilderness wanderings we talked about yesterday. His people inhabiting the promised land, the land of milk and honey that God had promised them all the way from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God had promised this land and now Moses sees the people inhabiting the land. But he didn't just see geographically, but he was able to look forward into the future and see the great events that would take place in that land, clear down to when Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, just over there to the south. Jesus would be born there in that little village and he would see the great events of what was going to happen there in the land. God repeats his promise, Deuteronomy 34, verse 4, to Moses that he's been saying all along, This is the land I promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. And then Moses looks for the last time, and he closes his eyes and dies at 120 years of age, and Deuteronomy 34, 7 says, Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. 120 years. A few years ago, I attended 
my grandmother's 100th birthday party in Houston, Texas. She was a remarkable woman. Her parents had crossed the United States in covered wagons, and yet she had seen people land on the moon. What a lifetime she had. 100 years old, she lived in an apartment building, uh, walked down to the elevator, took the elevator down to the bottom floor where the dining room was, ate with people. She didn't do a lot of cooking in her apartment at 100, but she had a kitchen and she did feed us from time to time in her own apartment. It was a great birthday party planned in the apartment building. And when I arrived from California, greeted the family that was there, I went over to see my grandmother. She said, Stuart, you're going to sing a song at the birthday party. You're going to sing, How Great Thou Art, and I'm going to play the piano for you. And I said, yes, ma'am, if that's what you want, that's what's going to happen. And sure enough, on the day of her birthday party, I got up and I said, now my grandmother is going to play How Great Thou Art on the piano, and I'm going to accompany her vocally. That's really how I felt. My grandmother was a remarkable Methodist woman. On her 100th birthday, she got up in her church and read the scripture reading to her congregation. Between her 100th birthday and the year that she died, she began to, to feel like she had lived a good enough life and she was ready to go. And she used to say to me, I wish God would just uh, leave me alone and let me die. I'm ready. Finally, she died uh, just uh, two years ago this month at 108 years old. What a remarkable woman she was. Didn't quite live as long as Moses. He died at 120. But I believe that we haven't seen the end of my grandmother. Can't wait until the great resurrection morning to be reunited with her in the heavens. And in fact, we haven't seen the last of Moses, even in this earth's history. The first of the human race to be resurrected, we believe, by Jesus himself, Moses appears in the pages of the New Testament, not on Mount Nebo, the mountain of his burial, but on the Mount of Transfiguration, given the great privilege of encouraging Jesus for his final earthly crisis. You can read about it in Matthew 17. What a privilege it was for Moses to come back to the promised land to meet Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Before we go on to talking about how Moses' people crossed into the promised land, let me add just a footnote to the life of Moses. There are some among us, as there always are, who believe that the biblical doctrine of salvation by grace alone, by faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, is only half of the story that we must somehow balance what God has done for sinners while they were dead in their transgressions with what our response to God should be. To these people, the story of Moses stands in sharp contradiction. For not even the one whom the Bible says the Lord knew face to face not even this one who did all these miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, not even with the inspired eulogy that no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did, not even this man can meet the requirements for entrance into heaven, perfect obedience, perfect motivation, perfect righteousness. The lesson should never be forgotten, says Ellen White in the chapter on this story in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. God requires exact obedience, unquote. And remember Steps to Christ, page 62, which we read on Sabbath. It was possible for Adam before the fall, to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law. 
But he failed to do this, and because of his sin, our natures are fallen, and we cannot make ourselves righteous. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. We have no righteousness of our own. Not even Moses had a righteousness of his own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid the trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinful, a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him, if you accept him as your savior, then sinful though your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had never fallen. Amen to that? What always surprises me about people who want the other half of the story told is not that these people underestimate the power of sin, which to a great extent all of us do from time to time, but that they so clearly undervalue the power of God's grace. Listen to these words from the writings of Ellen White. Nothing but the grace of God can convict and convert the heart. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 552. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. Steps to Christ, page 60. The gospel of His grace alone can cure the evils that curse society. That's from Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 66. God's grace alone can work a reformation. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4, page 378. It is the matchless grace of Christ alone which will triumph over the rebellion of the heart. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 321. It is... God's grace that gives us the power to obey the laws of God. It is this that enables us to break the bondage of evil, evil habit. Ministry of Healing, page 115. His matchless grace alone can save our feet from falling. That's manuscript 122 from 1897. Do you get the point? It is God's grace and God's grace alone that makes us overcomers. Not a focus on what some people love to call the other half of the story. It is the first half of the story, which is the entire story that gives us the power to overcome. The reality is clear. It is God's saving grace and nothing else that penetrates the stubborn casing of our rebellious, resistant heart and transforms us. It is grace that makes us desire grace. It is grace that makes us want to grow in Jesus, like 2 Peter 3.18 says. Well, I'm sorry, I'm off on a tangent, aren't I? <laughs> I wanted to talk about entering the promised land, and the only people that do that are people that accept God's grace. By the way, while I'm talking about God's grace, there are two books I want to call your attention to in the ABC. This lovely compilation of Ellen White's writings called God's Amazing Grace, the Daily Devotional for This Year is a reprint of a 1973, of the 1973 book the same way. And you will find here all kinds of quotations about God's Amazing Grace. This is a wonderful book. I've read it through and through and through over and over again. And there's some things you'll find in print here that you won't find anywhere else. And William Johnson's new book, Glimpses of Grace, Scenes from My Journey, is a lovely book. I looked at it again last night. Stories that Bill talks about from his 
own growing up, people that he's run into that have influenced him for grace. I know this family, and I know them to be grace-oriented people. And if you haven't read what Bill Johnson has to say about the glimpses of grace, stop by the ABC and pick those up. Well, Joshua 1. God meets with Joshua. Moses is dead. The children of Israel have mourned him for the requisite number of days. They stand to the east of the Jordan River, to the east of Jericho. They look into the promised land, and Joshua says, get ready. In three days, we're getting in there. God meets with him as the captain of uh, the Lord's hosts. He meets with him, and he gives them the promises again. You and all these people, Joshua chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. You and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them. And I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised to Moses. The promise is clear. You and I have heard them before this week. as We studied God's promises to Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and all of his people throughout the ages. God is the one who gives the land. We don't earn it on our own. He gives it to us. And so Joshua gets ready, tells the people to be strong and courageous. He tells them exactly how it's going to happen. He sends a couple of spies into Jericho to hear the news about what the people are saying about the Israelites crossing into the land. And the, is and the spies find out that the people who are inhabitants of Jericho and all the people in the land are so fearful that their hearts are melting in fear because of what's about to happen. Joshua tells the people, it's time to go in now. Here's what we're going to do. We'll have an armed guard that goes first. And then we're going to have seven men with trumpets who are going to blow the trumpets. And then the Ark of the Covenant will pass into the Jordan River. And then you keep a distance. Joshua chapter 3, verse 4. Keep a distance of about a thousand yards. I found studying for this morning that the note in my Bible says about 900 meters. Stay back that far from the ark and watch what happens. And he says to the priests who are carrying the ark of the covenant, you are to go down to the edge of the Jordan River and put your feet into the river and then watch what God happens. Oh, there's some interesting theories about this crossing of the Jordan River. I know you've heard of them too. One theory goes that the Jordan River at this time was just a, a little uh, trickle of water in, befew, in between a few pebbles. It was not a difficult thing at this place where the Jordan was to just step over the pedals and step over the trickle of water and walk right into the promised land. Interesting, some people have tried to find places where the Jordan River was the narrowest place, as close to Jericho as they could find, and think it really wasn't too far. They could just wade through this narrow little passage of the river. If you go up to the north in Israel, to uh, Caesarea Philippi, and find the, Jor the source of the Jordan River, it's not too wide at that point. It's clear and cold and on a hot day in Israel, it feels good to stick your head into that cold water and drink as much as you can. But people say it was just a shallow, tiny little place where they crossed. Some people have looked for a, a sandbar submerged just below the surface of the Jordan River and said the, the children of Israel walked across on the sandbar. And, and you have to walk out into the river and you don't know that it's there and all of a sudden you don't go any deeper and you're walking it looks like your your ankles are under the water and and then it looks like you're walking almost on top of the water at that place you can walk clear across the jordan river on a sandbar but the bible is very clear isn't it that that's not the case chapter 3 verse 15 says now the jordan is at flood stage all during harvest like God did when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he waited until the Jordan River, that last barrier between where the people were and where they wanted to be, when that barrier was at its biggest, its largest, 
It's most threatening when the river was running at its swiftest. God doesn't perform miracles on little trickles of water in between the, par the pebbles. He performs miracles on mighty rushing rivers. Nothing that you and I face in our daily life can be too big for God to overcome. No challenge that we face, no barrier between where we stand and where the promised land is, no barrier is too big for God to help us by parting the water for us. God doesn't wait for the tiny little things. He waits until we're helpless. We can't do it because the challenge is so big. He says to us, my power is made perfect in weakness, not in your strength. One of the theories is God waited until it was a trickle, not what the Bible's picture is. The other interesting theory that's contemporary today is the rabbinic theory that the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders followed Joshua's advice and went to the edge of the river and looked at this huge rushing river ahead of them and turned around and said to Joshua, are you sure this is what you want us to do? Get into the river? And Joshua said, yes, God's instructed for you to step into the river. And so the priest with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders stepped into the river until all of them who had the Ark on their shoulders were, had their feet in the river. And then the rabbinic theory goes, nothing happened. And they waited, they waited, and then they turned around and looked at Joshua and said, now what do we do? And Joshua says, keep walking. And so the priest, according to the theory, walked into the river until the water was up to their knees. And then they stopped. And they looked upstream to see the water stop. And it continued to course. And nothing happened. And they looked to Joshua and said, now what? And Joshua this time just points forward into the river. Not a word, just keep going. And so the priests waded in. Now the water rose up their legs and it was up to their waists and they stopped. And they looked to the upstream and the water was still coming and they looked just ahead of them and the water was obviously deeper and more swift and they were waiting to see what happened now and one of the priests looked over his shoulder and Joshua who was still pointing straight ahead. And so the priests waded in until the water was up to their chest and they knew if they turned and looked at Joshua, he would still be pointing. And they waited until the water was up to their chins. And they knew they had to keep going. And they kept going into the deeper part of the water until the water was up to their noses. And they had to tilt their heads back to keep their nostrils above. And they took one more step until their nostrils were under the water. And then the water finally separated. It's not the way the Bible says it happened. You see what happens if you believe the rabbinic tradition or the rabbinic telling of the story. The heroes of the story are the priests who waded into the river until they couldn't even breathe. Trusting God all the way that He would save them. That's not what happened. God didn't make the priests the heroes of the story. The hero of the story is God who separates the waters, not the humans who wade in until they can't breathe. It was interesting this morning early, I was looking at this passage again and remembering the words that God promised to Joshua back in, jo in Joshua 1. Get ready to cross the river into the land I am about to give you. God says to Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot. Even the Jordan River was theirs now. But the people had to set their feet in the river to prove that they were not the ones that were crossing, that were parting the waters. Put your feet in the water. It's not you that does it. All we have is the ability to take God at His Word and walk into the water. That's all we can do. You and I do not part rivers. God parts rivers. You and I do not make the waters dry up and the muddy ground underneath the rivers. 
be so dry that people can walk on it. I took a picture yesterday out in front of your caravan, Stephen, of the pathway just after a few days of rain and all the, all the grass in the pathway is turned to mud. I'm trying to walk in those little clumps of glass, grass where there's no mud and the children are walking around barefoot, stepping in the mud, just enjoying themselves. But the children of Israel, however many hundreds of thousands of them there were, imagine what would happen if just God had stopped the flow of the water and they tried to walk across on the muddy bottom of the river. How many hundred thousands would have gotten through before the mud was impassable? It wasn't just the stopping of the water that was a miracle. The, the river bed was dry and firm enough for hundreds of thousands of people to walk across. It was God who parted the waters. He did it at flood stage. He did it to prove that he parts the waters. We don't do those kinds of things. And so the priest walked into the middle of the river. And the river receded upstream a ways and it stood there. And it continued on down until they couldn't see the river on the downstream part. And then all the people began to cross into the promised land. Every last one of them crossing over, one after another, one after another, family after a family. The day that they had been waiting for since the moment they left Egypt had finally come and they were going into the promised land. The next day, I'm going to come back to the middle of this just a moment, but the next day a couple of important things happened. Do you remember that the next day, the first day inside the promised land, they were camped there at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho. The next day, the Israelites celebrated the Passover, chapter 5, verse 10. And the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Do you remember these people who had been eating the fruits of the desert for 40 years, who had been existing on manna, which should have been Happy food for all of them, but they even grumbled at the food of heaven. Been eating that for all these years, but they hadn't had the good fruit, the good vegetables, the good grain. It had been missing from their diet from all these years. And the day after they ate the Passover together, in the promised land, they began to eat the fruit of the land. And then verse 12 says, the next day, the manna stopped. No need for earthly people to eat heavenly food when you're, when we, there's a great need when you're wandering around in the desert. But when you're in the promised land, it doesn't need to rain down. You can go and pick the fruit from the trees that you did not plant and drink the water from wells that you did not dig. And the people left the manna experience behind. It's a wonderful thought that God in our wilderness wandering gives us heavenly manna day after day. A taste of what it's going to be like to be in heaven with Him. A taste of what it means to communicate with Him. But we do it from a distance here. We get it in the morning. We eat it all day. We have to gather it again for real. The next day it doesn't go from day to day. We must gather it. But when we get into the promised land, no longer will we be communicating darkly, but then we'll see him face to face. What a wonderful day that's going to be. What a wonderful time to eat the communication of meeting and seeing and talking with Jesus. I don't know how it's going to happen. Because the multitude that is saved is larger than any human can ever number. But somehow we'll be able to walk and talk with Jesus like we were the only ones in heaven. We won't have to stand in line. We won't have to take a number. Yes, you'll be able to have a five-minute interview with Jesus in 10,500,720 years from now. No, it won't happen that way. You and I will walk and talk with Jesus like we're the only ones there. We'll eat a great feast the day after we get into heaven, and from then on, the manna stops, and we eat face to face. 
Oh, this is a great story about how God crosses, makes the river crossing real for us. He performs the miracle. He gives us the land. We get to eat it face to face. But the crossing wasn't over yet. Joshua also instructed that there would be one man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to perform a very special function on the way through the river. I told you the other day that I love it when the Bible says that something that happened in the Bible is there to this day. I love it because it means that you and I can read it like we were there. The other thing I really enjoy when the Bible says is whenever it says one from each tribe of Israel, 12 men, one from each tribe, and that always means that you and I are included. doesn't matter what tribe or nation or family or kindred or culture you're from, you're included in this story. One from every tribe was there. Whoever we are, whatever our home country, whatever our language, whatever our culture, this is for us. You and I are included in this point. And Joshua says to these 12 men, when you get to the middle of the river, stop at the place where the priests are standing with the Ark of the Covenant and pick up a stone that's small enough for you to carry on your shoulder, but significant enough that we can build an altar with it. And so each of the men that was chosen by their, their tribe, their clan to be the representative, they stopped as their part of the family went through the river and they stooped down and they picked up a rock and they put it on their shoulder and they marched out of the river and finally put the rock down where they camped the next night. Finally, all the people had crossed over the river. All the people except uh, the women and children of the two and a half tribes that were going to inhabit the land on the east of the river. But their husbands were there to, uh, to go across. The fathers and the brothers were go across to help guard the children of Israel. The people finally crossed over the river and spent their first night in the promised land. And Joshua gets them all together in Joshua chapter 4 toward the end. The priests have now come out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground that the river coursed again in the full fury of flood stage. And Joshua gathered all the people together and raised his voice. And he said, we're now in the promised land. This is the place that God has promised to our fathers. We're camping inside the gates of grace. Inside the camp of God. And he asked the men with the twelve stones to come forward from the middle of the river and to put them down. And there at the camping place, he built an altar with these twelve stones. And this is what he says, chapter 4, verse 21. Joshua said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For years and generations, one family member after another would go to their grave and the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and the great-great-grandchildren would inhabit the land. And from time to time at Gilgal, a little family would be walking by and someone, would, some one of the children would say, what, are, what is that pile of stones there? Tell me the story that's represented by that pile of stones. And the parents would raise their voice with joy in their hearts and say to the children, this is the place where Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. And the children would say, what do you mean cross the Jordan? This river right here? This is the place, the parents would say, this is the place where we crossed on dry ground. This is the way that all great traditions should serve the people of God. 
we have nothing to fear except we forget how God has led us in the past. We have nothing to fear except we begin to focus on what we should be doing and the effort that we should be putting into it and the works that we have to be doing. We have nothing to fear as long as we remember that it is God who saves us. We don't save us ourselves. We have nothing to fear as long as we look at all of the wonderful stories of God's people throughout the ages, of our tradition as well, of our wonderful church, of the mothers and fathers of our church, where they began and where the missionaries went to and the, the first churches in every land that grows up. Unless we forget that it was God that made the rivers part. It was God that helped us to cross over on dry ground. We didn't do it ourselves. And we must say to our children, this is the place. This building was the place. This campground is the place. My heart is the place. That's what we tell our children. Here is where God has worked in our behalf. Many years later, the king of, of uh, Israel, long time later, a king named Hezekiah would walk into the temple grounds and say, it's time we cleaned up this mess and restored the temple to what it ought to be. You remember the great story of how Hezekiah begins to send the priest in to, to cleanse the courtyard of the temple, to cleanse the holy place of the temple. And it takes weeks to do it. But one of the first things that happens is that Hezekiah walks into the courtyard and he goes over to a priest and he says, what is that in the corner? And the priest looks over and he said, That's, uh, that is the bronze pole that Moses raised in the desert. Do you remember the story? The snakes had been attacking and God said to Moses, craft a bronze snake and put it on a pole and raise it up and everyone who looks at the pole will be saved. Years later, Jesus would say to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so I have to be lifted up. Jesus said of Moses' serpent, that was a symbol of me. This great bronze snake that was lifted up. And the priest said to Hezekiah, that's the very bronze snake that Moses lifted up in the wilderness. And King Hezekiah said to the priest, what are the people doing? Ah, oh, the priest said, it's kind of a sad story. And many of our believers, many in our nation now, believe that there are some magical powers in that bronze snake. And they have begun to worship it. And they've brought offerings to the snake. They're worshiping the bronze snake on the pole that Moses had raised. And Hezekiah, in God-given fury, went over to the pole and he pulled it out of its place and he broke it on the ground and smashed it to pieces. The Bible says that this bronze snake had received such reverence among the children of Israel, they had even given it a name, Nehushtan, they called it. And Hezekiah said, not going to happen in my country while I'm the king here. We will not worship the symbols we will worship the God that the symbols represent. You see the difference between Joshua's altar and the Nehushtan. Both supposedly remembrances of how God had led us and saved us. Joshua's altar, to tell people this is where God parted the waters, this is where Israel crossed on dry ground. Moses, the serpent given by God, intended to draw the attention of people to God. A symbol that Jesus himself said refer to him. A God-given symbol, but under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Hezekiah breaks the symbol and says, we must not worship the symbols. We must worship the God that the symbols point us to. You see the difference? Joshua's altar pointed people back to God and what he had done. The Nehushtan, people began to worship the symbol. Nothing wrong with symbols. 
The Sabbath is a symbol that God has given us. But you and I have met people that worshiped the Sabbath, not the God of the Sabbath, haven't we? And suddenly all these rules and regulations begin to multiply. The pharisaical approach to Sabbath keeping takes over and suddenly we're bowing down to the Sabbath and forgetting the God that the Sabbath is supposed to point us to. God said, I give you the sign, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you that I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. You're not doing it yourself. Sometimes institutions become symbols and we begin to worship the symbol instead of the God that the institution was started to draw us to. Every time we ought to remember when we face those symbols, let's face them in the light of Joshua's altar. Let people say, what are these stones about? What is this institution about? What is the Sabbath about? What is the symbol that Seventh-day Adventists stand for? What is it all about? There's only one answer to the question. It's about God and what God does for human beings. That's what we're about. May all the symbols in your life today, all the God-given symbols, your churches, your institutions, the Sabbath, everything that you hold dear as a reminder of what God has done for us in the past, May it be like Joshua's altar to you. Taken from the middle of what has stood between us and the promised land for many years. Take that altar, raise it up to God, tell people this is where God has led us. The hero of this story is God and what He does. God saves us. He promises that He will give to you and me the promised land. This morning, let's consecrate ourselves to accepting the whole story of justifying grace that makes the promised land possible for you and me. Let's thank Him for that right now. Heavenly Father, we come to You at this moment at the end of another story from Your precious Word that reminds us of what a good God that You are. It reminds us of what You have done for us in the past what you are doing for us now in the present, and someday what we have to look forward to, literally crossing into the heavenly promised land because of what you have done. We know, Heavenly Father, that our song at that day will be that this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. We know that none of us who are there will be there remembering anything we have done or suffered or endured that the song on every one of our lips will be salvation belongs to the Lamb. Help us to sing that song today on this campground in every step that we take. And thank you for putting that song in our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.